a number of uh, aspects of hate speech that we need to focus on. You know, there's the immediate context in Ireland, why it's being discussed now and proposed now, and then there's what it is in the first instance, where it comes from. To deal, first of all, with the, the governmental, Irish government's sudden interest in this concept, which is a new concept. Like, nobody's ever heard this before in Ireland. Well, clearly, it's because they want to shut down all criticism or dissent in relation to their policies in certain areas. And, and they will succeed in that if they succeed in bringing in hate speech, because they will intimidate people. Even, even if nobody goes to jail, they will, it will have a chilling effect. So that's clearly part of their intention. And it's to misrepresent the situation to the public, to imply that there's some dark, sinister force out there, the far right, the alt-right, it's a f I don't know, is there supposed to be a difference between those two things? Uh, that these guys now, these clowns, keep repeating these mantras. Romano Guardini, the uh, great uh, priest and philosopher, used to talk about a society in a particular stage of degeneration as being plotted with catchwords. Well, now you can see that in Ireland, coming out of every politician's mouth, the same phrases, the far right, the alt right. Like, they just repeat each other's mouth. They have no idea what any of these phrases mean. Uh, they have a vague idea who they're trying to target with these, and who they're trying to tar target is anybody who questions their agenda. Now, the agenda in Ireland is very specific because it arises from the fact that Ireland is actually a vassal state. We are entirely in the hands of outside forces, once again, as truly as we were under English dominion uh, over 100 years ago. Uh, our politicians, therefore, are not our politicians. They're not our leaders. I saw them at the ploughing championships and they were being chased by various people to make comments about certain things and they were all running away. And I thought, these guys are like the viceroys of old now. They represent outside interests in Ireland. They don't represent the Irish people. As soon as they are elected, they cease to represent those who voted for them. They represent other forces, which we can't see. But they are, in general. The EU, obviously. The United Nations is another one. But increasingly, and more so, uh, big tech, who are these companies who have their European headquarters in Dublin, who come here uh, basically to avoid taxes in America or wherever they're from, usually they're from America. And to, so they're basically quasi-criminal operations at that level, like they're tax dodgers. And we welcome them and they have poisoned the, 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 the groundwater of our culture, of our ethical culture in relation to all these matters. Because they have created a moral hazard in relation to taxation, which I don't see how anybody can be impelled or compelled to pay tax given what's going on in our country. But they're here and, and they have established something new in, in Ireland that isn't yet in place in elsewhere. It's a kind of an experiment. And it's kind of a, a public-private form of government where the, these tech companies seem to kind of be part of the government insofar as they come up with a lot of, of the agenda and impose it on the politicians. And the politicians willingly go along with it. And that has to do with changing Ireland fundamentally. And we saw that in relation to gay marriage. You know, gay marriage was n came out of nowhere. You know, 10 years ago, nobody was talking about gay marriage. Suddenly, it was the most important right of a generation. It's a completely manufactured right. Uh, the same, they were interested in having abortion. Big tech companies, all these companies, tax dodgers, they want abortion for all kinds of reasons. Ideological reasons, obviously, because that's where they're coming from but also because they need it for their business, because they employ women and they don't want women having to take time off to have babies. So it's in their interest to have, they need to have abortion in the society in which they operate. It's an extraordinary, extremely urgent matter for them. So, and now the, 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 the also in, 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 in parallel with all this, you know, basically the disintegration of the idea of Ireland as 
a place in which only Irish people by and large lived, or that it was an Irish Ireland, that kind of idea, is also on their agenda to, to abolish. And so they're dictating all this stuff. And you can see this very clearly in a lot of the way that, that, that politicians behave, because they don't really understand even a lot of the stuff they're talking about. And very often what you see like in relation to the direct provision, despite what the media will tell you, that this is about racism and the far right, this is about one thing and one thing only. It's about the corruption of the government, which refuses to talk to people about what it is doing to or trying to do to their communities. It is attacking communities all over the country, it's tiny villages, people who have created cohesive communities to protect themselves and their families are being told, we're taking that, we're taking that, and you have no say. We're going to impose another 25% of completely alien uh, uh, people on your community, and you have no say in that whatsoever. And then anybody who raises a question about that is called a racist. And they set out these shills, these thugs and, and bullies going around with placards, uh, attacking these good, decent people in their own communities. People who are being paid, make no mistake about it, they're being paid one way or another, directly or indirectly, uh, by the Irish government to actually be, as I said, the blue shirts of the 21st century, to go into villages and intimidate people and, and accuse people wrongly and frighten people into silence. And hate speech is a further escalation of that because what has happened now is that certain people, journalism in Ireland is dead, right? By and large, it's dead. RT is not a journalistic enterprise. It's dying. It's dying and it needs the support of the government to survive. So therefore, it is not going to do anything other than what the government wants. That's clear. And it is doing that. Newspapers are pretty much in the same boat. Irish Times. I wrote about that in my book. Uh, give us back the bad roads, uh, the, the independent, the same, the examiner, the same, which is owned by the Irish Times anyway. So none of these uh, newspapers are any longer newspapers. They're not representing the public interest. They're not representing the people. They're not, they're, if they were, they would be asking questions about what's going on. They would have been asking where gay marriage came out of. They would be t trying to put up an opposition, regardless of their own views to the question of, of destroying the first country in the world to, a t to, to hold a referendum to attack the fundamental right to life of a section of its own population. Not even the Nazis did that, and our media supported it. So we have the same thing now with the mass migration issue, that all they're doing is attacking, on behalf of the government, anybody who raises a question. They're attacking communities, smearing communities. And so a number of people have come out of the woodwork. Want to be journalists, in most, citizen journalists, you know, people who, who uh, uh, have no, no axe to grind, are not making any money, but they are interested in journalism. And they have started to cover these questions. I'm talking about Jim O'Doherty and Grant Torino and, uh, and uh, Gareth Murphy, some great people. Uh, Gareth Murphy is an exceptional journalist like a forensic journalist, uh, uh, computing forever, Dave Cullen. Uh, there's there's, a, there's a, a growing number of these people. And these are being labelled the far right, when all they are doing is doing the job that journalists are too corrupt and cowardly to do. And this is now the next step, to silence them, not just in terms of protecting the government, but in terms of protecting the media from the truth that they are now avoiding and the shame that should be theirs on account of avoiding it. So they need to silence and put these people out of business so that n everybody will say, oh yeah, that, that was just some far-right fascists. No, these were some good, decent Irish people trying to give people a voice about their country in a time when the government and the media were determined to deny them that voice. It's likely to be successful in, in, in the short term. People will be intimidated. But that will be, there will be a build-up of tension about that. Uh, and there will be a, a, a growing number of people who will see that for what it is. And I have told, I have warned the government that, you know, if they want to turn Ireland into Czechoslovakia, they're going the right way about it. And we know what happened in Czechoslovakia. And it took a while. But in the end, the people in their shoes who did what they are trying to do in Ireland 
who did that in Czechoslovakia were shamed before all history, before all time. Uh, and the same will happen here, for sure. But it will take time. And there will be a lot of grief and pain, you know. And, 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 uh, but there are people who are prepared to endure that now. Because, you know, we learned our history in school. We were probably among the last generations to learn it. And we learned about the blood that was spilt in this country for the freedoms that are now being attacked. You know, I don't see that there isn't at least, you know, a significant minority of people still out there who have the residual passion and memory of that knowledge to fight for it again. They will, how, I mean, how, how can we, you know, commemorate only a couple of years ago, Pierce and Connolly and McDonough and those guys, and then give up the things that they fought for, that they gave to us? I mean, how shameful would that be? It won't happen. It won't happen. It can't happen. People will need to reflect. Because people, you see, we have no idea, we had no idea that this could be going to happen in our country. We grew up complacent. We grew up thinking we had a free country. We had a free country in the 70s and 80s. It was a nice place to live. It was growing. It, it wasn't perfect economically and all the rest. It needed, it never reached that point where it was self-sustaining. But, and that's our big problem, because then we import all these foreign companies in to do the job so the politicians don't have to think or envisage or envision. And so we, we, but so we grew up in, in, a, in a place that was decent for all that the media tried to demonize it. And now it's not. Now it's not. It's, that's going. All those, f that sense of uh, Ireland being a free place that belonged to us, that's going. You, I think that any politician who thinks that the Irish people will lie down under tyranny again has got to have his head examined. He's got to have his head examined. I certainly won't. I, I, I keep saying to people, you know, I'm 64 years of age. In 20 years I'll be dead. What can they do to me? You can't kill a dead man. I'm not, I'm not going to lie down under this. And neither are, you know, a million others. And we don't care who's calling it. Radker, Flanagan, whoever they are, bring it on. Uh, but. It's very important to understand where this is coming from because this is a completely imported idea. Hate speech. It's an invention of an ideology and it's part of an ideology that I want to just briefly explain. It's sometimes called culture Marxism. It's not a very good phrase for it because Marxism is not the totality of it. But it is, in a certain sense, a mutant form of Marxism which has moved the Marxist idea from the economic realm predominantly where it, where it resided to the more intimate uh, area of uh, personal identity, sexual identity and these areas. So that's where you get this all this identity politics coming from. And essentially what it is, is, is this modern form of Marxism stirring up hatreds among peoples, gay versus straight, women versus men. Uh, blacks versus whites, and so on. I, d I didn't realise 25 years ago when I started writing about fatherhood and, and incurred the wrath of the feminists that I actually had stumbled right into the heart of the storm, into the eye of the storm. I was already there in the mid-90s uh, writing about this. I had no idea what I was doing. I was floundering, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. How come everybody's talking about human rights? But when I propose this human right, everybody says, no, 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 fathers have no, no, no. You have they have no rights and they should have no rights. That's what I was more or less told by journalists who later turned up on the front line of the gay marriage debate, saying the direct opposite, saying that a stranger to a child who happened to be married to that fa child's parent had more rights than the father of that child who had none. So I, I, this is all stuff that, that was new to me, and I stumbled into it. So, in the la so what this is then is that uh, these politicians in Ireland import this. It's come in here, and they see an opportunity because they have all these LGBT goons on the streets who who storm stormtroopers who've been doing this for years now, and they're 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 kind of like amount to a private army now 
for politicians who will do all the dir dirty work. It's interesting if you look uh, that they just don't confine themselves to LGBT issues any longer. They'll turn up in, in issues to do with migration, for example. Why are they there? Because there's a trade-off. The trade-off is they'll do the government's dirty work if the government allows them into schools to teach children about masturbation at six or seven years of age. That's the deal. So it's pretty much that's the deal. Things like that. So all this stuff is actually happening. It's very hard to believe that this is happening in our country. For somebody who lived here all these years, like from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, this is like, we used to read Orwell in school. We, re we read Animal Farm, and then afterwards we read 1984. And we used to kind of have this sense of fascination among ourselves, thinking, what kind of societies were, could it be that would generate this kind of oppression, this kind of tyranny? Well, now we know. We're in the middle of it now. It's happening here in front of our eyes. Believe it, it's, 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 it's incredible. It's incredible. But it's happening. It's, it's actually happening day by day now you can see it. You can see it in the tone of the politicians. Charlie Flanagan, I mean, like, recently on RTE, he, he, he was asked, uh, well, for examples of hate speech, and, and the only one he could think of was something that happened to him. Now, the last time I looked at a picture of Charlie Flanagan, he wasn't black. And I don't think he's gay. And I know he's not a woman, not yet anyway. And, and, and here he was. The only instance he could think of was that some guy followed him around at the plowing championship, asking him a question about mass migration. And he described this guy as, I think, alt-right. What does alt-right mean? Does anybody know in Ireland what alt-right means? Nobody knows. It's a meaningless phrase that was imported from America. All this is imported from America or elsewhere. And you hear, you hear people now talking about, you know, in Ireland, about white supremacy. There is no white supremacy in Ireland. And you know why? Because there are no white people in Ireland. We are not white. We were never white. White people only exist in the world in places where there is a political agenda, an ideological agenda that places them in opposition to other races. That never happened in Ireland. It never was an issue in Ireland whatsoever. We're not white. I have never once in my life ticked a box that says I am white. But we have a corrupt media. There is nobody willing to stand up because, you see, not alone do the media not report and, and, and talk about these things in a way that would be useful to the people to help them, but its sole role, self-allocated role, is to attack anybody who tries to talk about them publicly. So as soon as you open your mouth to even discuss them, once they know that you're not on their side, they start to attack you and demonise you and call you names. It's a con hate speech is a concept that is used only one way in relation to certain conflicts. So in the LGBT issue, for example, if I were to say something nasty, I never have to an LGBT person or a gay person. I never have. And they were to report me to the police, to the guards, I would be prosecuted for sure. I have been on Twitter attacked by LGBT activists. There was a, 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 a a meme, I think they're called, uh, a, couple, a couple of years ago there, where uh, the thing was, you know, uh, if you see John Waters, punch him from me. I'll pay your bail. So I collected up some of these and I went to the, to the guards. And a couple of months later, they came around and said, oh, John, you know, oh, sure, we know you're pushing an open door, you're 100% right, oh, it's terrible, yeah, but, you know, the law hasn't caught up on all this kind of harassment, you know? But if... The LGBT have a complaint. They're pretty uh, uh, fast uh, out of the gate. And they were pretty fast to paint their cars with the rainbow colours for Pride this year. What kind of faith does somebody like me, who's had an issue like that, have in the, the police force now when he sees them going around with rainbow colours having refused to, to entertain my complaint. What expectation does the citizen have, the ordinary citizen have, of justice 
been upheld in the society. And it's not just that. We know other cases where people have been assaulted in relation to the migration issue. Gars did nothing. So this is a f profound corruption that has entered into our whole uh, 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 culture now. But as regards the, the question of hate speech being, you see, there are laws if people are offensive to each other beyond a certain point. If the law is broken, if somebody is assaulted, if somebody is uh, uh, intimidated, if somebody is harassed, there's plenty of laws to deal with that. This isn't about that. It's very interesting if you actually look at what they're calling racism now and the way they do it. It's very interesting when you look at some of the episodes we've had recently because what you, what you see is that the word racist is appended to somebody's name first without any evidence being offered. And the word goes out, oh, sh racist, racist, racist. But there's no, everybody's kind of saying, well, what did this person say? No evidence. No hate speech. Said something nasty about minorities. Which, by the way, isn't necessarily racist. Not at all. And then eventually what you actually find is they'll find one thing and they'll put it out and everybody will nod their heads and say that's racist. But when you look at it, it's not. Not at all racist, because racist is, is the assertion of superior, the superiority of one race over another by, v by virtue of the race of, that, of p certain people. It's not just saying something that a black person doesn't like or a white person doesn't like. That's not racist. But in our culture now, it has become that. <coughs> you can make that stick now. So that, in other words, we, what you're trying to move, what you're moving towards a situation where it would be impossible to say anything whatsoever other than praise, unadulterated praise of somebody who is a particular, whether they're gay or black or whatever it is. That's where we're going. Otherwise, you're guilty of hate speech. The kind of normal cut and trust that is part of every society, never mind democracy, democratic society, every society, every community, where people banter and people criticise and people argue, that will be gone. We won't be permitted to argue because somebody will say, oh, I'm offended now. I'm going to the, to the guards. Well, get your toothbrush ready because you're going to Wheatfield. That's the future of our so-called democracy under this regime, which is an importation. It's very important that, you know, because there's such a dearth of information, I want to just recommend to people that they read a, a particular book. And that's just come out by a, a man called Douglas Murray, who's a gay man. Gay man, he writes for The Spectator in, in, in London. And he's written a book called The Madness of Crowds, which deals with the question of identity politics. And he's broken it down into four categories. Feminism, LGBT, race, and trans. He gives this particular section to trans, which he regards as the most sinister and dangerous of all. And I agree with him. Because trans is going to destroy tens, if not hundreds of thousands of young people forever, for all of their lives. They're going to be destroyed by this madness. And Douglas Murray says, for example, about the LGBT campaigns, and he's a gay man, he says that the purpose of them is to derange society. To derange society. I, I, I have no doubt that that's true. I've long suspected that. And this is what all of this stuff is about. But what is interesting in our culture is that, that conservative so-called politicians are doing it. Well, now they are getting involved. And there are two reasons. One is because, as I say, we're a vassal state. We, the politicians we have are not capable of running any kind of Ireland other than the one that exists, as with them as the messenger boys of, of external agents. Uh, that's one reason that they're engaged in, in, in this. That's, it's, you know, uh, uh, the second thing is that it protects their parties and themselves from any possible threat. Remember that there is a revolution, which you won't have heard much about other in, uh, in the Irish media, other than as a far-right phenomenon, but there's a revolution uh, sweeping across Europe in the last uh, two or three years, where parties who actually 
challenge these ideologies are going, growing exponentially. We saw it in Spain very recently, only last week, uh, where the Vox Party, which is described in the Irish media ritually as far right, it's not a far right, it's just a commonsensical party of the middle, of the mainstream, which listens to people's concerns and tries to give them a voice in Parliament. They doubled their uh, uh, number of seats in the Spanish Parliament since last May. Think about that now. Six months. They've doubled. They've gone to 52 seats. A year ago, they were, hadn't been even heard of. So they have 52 seats. They're now like something like coming up to 20% of the uh, number of seats in Parliament after less than a year. And that's a country that has traditionally been left-wing for a long time. So what the media and the politicians are trying to do is keep the lid on Ireland. You know, there was a, a very funny article. The Irish Times doesn't normally publish funny articles, but somebody sent me one there last week, which was like, explained that the reason there has been no populist uh, activity in Ireland is because we have such a, a, a good press. You know, we had such a, a, you know, a, a, a high standard of journalism. You know, so like they're, they're capable of great comedy. It has to be said. There's a, in the introduction that he wrote to uh, Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, John Paul Sartre uh, wrote about Fanon's. Fanon was a great Algerian or a Caribbean psychiatrist who wrote about the Algerian situation during the Civil War. Brilliant books, The Wretched of the Earth, Black Skin, White Masks. And John Paul Sartre said, and I think it was the introduction to that, but I remember him saying this. He said that he was t outlining Fanon's warning to the world, to Europe particularly, and how, and it was a very severe warning about the consequences of colonialism in the world. And and uh, Jean Paul Sartre said, "Now you expect me to say unless, unless we do something now, unless we turn things round, there's no unless." Can it be stopped now? And he was right about that, as we are seeing. But I think that the same is true in Ireland. I, I, I actually don't know that it's not too late to stop what is happening to Ireland. I, I, would, I would greatly hope that we would stop, uh, we'd be able to stop the kind of conflict which is inevitable arising from all of this laggardism and, and, and mendacity and, and, and corruption and cowardice. But I don't know that we can, uh, because what they're doing is they're attacking the fundamentals of democracy. In the last 10 years, there are five articles in the Irish Constitution which deal with the fundamental human rights of citizens, natural rights of citizens. Not, they're not extended by the state, they're natural rights, they're God-given rights. And I've said a, man, a million times that the reason that they're there is to simply remind people of their rights. But the government has tried to destroy these on paper, which is not possible, by the way. If we had a decent court system that you could go to, they would be told to get lost. Uh, but Articles 40 to 44, they're the fundamental human rights. And already they've destroyed Articles 41 and 42, which are do we deal with the family and ch education of children, all that. They're, they're meaningless now. In, it hasn't been tested yet, but when it is, the judges will just have to say, well, these words don't really mean anything because the people have spoken in a different way. And then Article 40, the funda most fundamental right of all, the right to life. And now they're talking about the attack on free speech. They're talking about, we've also had attacks on private property, uh, the attacks on landlords and, and people who rent out their ho houses to people are basically treated now as if they're criminals and so on. So we've radical, there's a, been an, a, an attack at the very root of our freedoms. And it's quite late in the day. You know, we tried to oppose that, but it w people weren't picking up because the media is so crooked. That you didn't get a platform. And it, you know, because, you know, one or two voices isn't enough because then you just sound like a crank. And that's what you, they think you are. Well, but this is what I think, Tim. I, 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 this is what I think. I think that... How will I put this? I mean, I, 
the moment that we're at, it seems to me, is analogous to the moment, if you remember 9-11, uh, that day watching the, the towers burn. And uh, there was a period of about an hour between th the plane hitting the second tower and the tower starting to fall. Less than an hour, I think it was about 56 minutes. And it was the same tower, that, uh, oddly. The, 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 the second tower to be hit was the first tower to fall. There are reasons for that, by the way. It's not a cons there's no <laughs> I don't want to let in any conspiratorial theories about this. I don't buy into those. Uh, there were reasons to do with the insulation of the, the, the girders in the building. But for that 56 minutes, which we didn't remember as such, but which we all remember being there, what were, what were, what was our heads full of? It was full of questions about how are they going to put the fire out? How is this going to be ended? Are they going to get helicopters and fly around and spray something on the, the flames? And then it started to come down like an accordion closing. We, I, I. Describing it, I can feel it again. It was a feeling like nothing I'd ever felt before. This is like impossible. This cannot be happening. Because I understood what it meant. It was a metaphor. It was a symbol which was specifically generated to convey this message. Your civilization will fall. Your civilization will fall. Well, that's where we are now. But it's not planes. It's ideology, it's LGBT, it's Antifa. These are the forces that have hit our tower. They've already hit it. It's going to fall. The question is, what are we going to do afterwards? How do we rebuild our civilization? How do we get rid of these people? How do we stop this happening again? What, how do we pick up the pieces of whatever is left after this calamity has reached its conclusion. I really believe that that's true. I really believe that, that, that we've been, I've been picking at this for 20 odd years, not knowing what I was dealing with. You know, you think in each module, you think this is just a little uh, uh, dogfight. Uh, gender, feminism versus men, uh, you know, the racism thing, you know, had no place here. There was never an issue with race in Ireland. But they're importing the idea of white supremacy. Like, this is nonsense beyond belief. You know, like, you see, white supremacy allows for a motor mechanic earning $60 a week to be told by a black lawyer who earns two million a year that he's got white privilege. That's how corrupt this ideology is. It's rooted in something that is not real. It's got nothing to do with reality. And we've imported it now completely. And we're entirely dependent on it because our government is not our government. Google is our government. Twitter is our government. And these people have this agenda. So the only way of actually beginning the process of taking our country back is to knock on Mr. Google's door and tell him, there's a plane leaving at five, I think you should be on it. Who's going to do that? Where are we going to get the people who are going to do it, who have the bottle to do that? And say, we can live without your few miserable dollars. We'll start again. We've done it before. We've overed worse in our time. We've overed worse in our time. This is a country that has come, bef had been, uh, been hit by innumerable calamities. And we've survived. We can survive. But my point is, and we will survive, or something of Ireland will survive. But my point is that the pain that will occur in the interim 
will be comparable to some, to some of the periods of the past. Perhaps not the worst, like the famines, but it will be pretty bad. So the sooner we start fighting back, the better for ourselves.